The Catholics of Oz is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Episode 3 of Catholics of Oz. Catholics of Oz is a show where we discuss faith, culture, and what's been happening from an Australian perspective. Whether it's synods or science, apostolates and apps, providence or productivity, you can hear it right now on the Catholics of Oz. Hi, I'm Lindsay Sant, and welcome to Catholics of Oz. Joining me for episode three today is Caroline. How are you, Caroline? Um, well, thanks. Good to have you back in the chair. And Jared, how about yourself? How are you going? Excellent. Very well. All Glad right. to be here. Good. And we've got the trio together. So before we begin today's show, remember that you can like Catholics of Oz on Facebook and you can comment there. You can share our episodes through Facebook. You can retweet them on Twitter. You can leave comments for us uh, there and you can also leave comments on their SQPN page, sqpn.com slash Oz. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app. We're also on YouTube. You can listen to the audio there and you can just hit the bell to get notifications. Don't forget to leave feedback for us and also to reach out to us and talk to us about our show. So with that out of the way, let's, uh, let's get started on our, our discussions for today. So um, today we wanted to begin um, by talking about Faith Beyond Borders in a way that we least expected it. Well, I'm actually feeling rather good about this. I think we've all arrived at a very special place, eh? Oh. Spiritually, ecumenically. How do you make somebody love you without affecting free will? <laughs> Welcome to my world, son. You come up with an answer to that one, you let me know. Yes, I had to work very hard to, to pass Latin and theology. Oh, quite. Those are, of course, the most important things. Oh, yeah. I'd sit this one out, Cap. I don't see how I can. These guys come from legend. They're basically gods. There's only one god, man. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. So, guys, I'll, I'll give you some background to this, to how I found out about this story. So, last year... Um, in September, I was, uh, I was actually, uh, it was our school holidays, our term three school holidays, and I was driving my family home from Sydney. So we'd gone to Sydney for a family holiday and we broke the journey up into a two day trip. Um, so because we had Alexander, um, who was six or seven months at the time. And so with a, with a young baby, it was easier just to, you know, drive about five hours, stay somewhere and then do the last four or five hours and come home. So halfway through, we stopped at, stopped at a motel, we were having dinner, um, and then on the TV, um, there was this news story about Bill Hayden, uh, um, ex-politician from, you know, from the good old days, um, who, 85 years old now, but all through his time as a politician, in his own words, he was a really strong atheist. And I almost dropped my... <laughs> like my dinner, whatever I was having my dinner, I was dropped everything I was eating, uh, because the the news was that he was being baptized a Catholic. Um, so shocking story in in one sense, uh, and it made me think, what what makes a you know a self admitted hardened atheist, Australian, you know Australians very dinky die down to earth kind of things, you know, how did he, how was it that he, uh, made this decision, to turn against 85 years of his life, his previous life, and say, I'm getting baptized. What happens to a person when they do that? So we thought we might just explore this story very quickly through a couple of different um, news articles that we've, we've got about this, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. So, Jared, I might um, start with you. So you've, um, you've got a publication there um, from a Catholic source. Yes, yeah, um, catholicleader.com. The Catholic you? Leader, right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what's reported about Bill Hayden in The Catholic Leader? Right, so uh, former Governor General and was, I think, briefly the opposition leader. So not just a politician, but almost top of the pile. Yeah, alternative Prime Minister, <laughs> isn't that what we call them? Um, yeah, yeah. Opposition yeah. leader, yeah. So he was, uh, I think, Treasurer, possibly in the Gough Whitlam years, I think. Um, I, although I only came on board just before the um, that that uh, government was dissolved and Malcolm Fraser took over. This is back in the 70s. And then was opposition leader, lost the uh, subsequent election by, uh, obviously, Labor had gotten pummeled, uh, 
uh, Bill Hayden is a Labor and uh, the opposition side is Liberal. Um, Labor had gotten pummeled after they'd been deposed from um, power in 1975. Um, I can't remember the exact reasons. Where Whitlam was dismissed yes. by the Governor General, yep. Yeah, and um, and so he brought them back within um, you know, as as a force in the nineteen eighties, and then was taken over by Bob Hawke. Um, Bill Hayden actually resigned, as opposed to the coups that we see in the last you know six or eight years from both sides of the, <laughs> of, the, of, the of, polis, yeah. of the politics. For anyone who's listening who's not in Australia, we've had uh, what is it five or six prime ministers in the last. <laughs> Who is the latest prime minister currently? I just even can't remember. I, I don't know. Do we, uh, we have a prime minister? Yeah. Yeah, well, we well, do. Look, Scott Morrison's prime minister at Scobo, the moment. Yeah, Scobo, Yeah, <laughs> and he's prime minister because he deposed his leader. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull, Who and Malcolm deposed? Turnbull was prime minister because he deposed. <laughs> yes. There's been a succession yeah. through depos- deposition, yeah. deposing. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're living in Shakespeare right now, guys. This is Julius yeah. Caesar, yeah. <laughs> Australian style. Yeah. Anyway, as Lizzie said, back in the good old days when someone else wanted to be power, um, Bill Hayden just resigned and let Bob Hawke take over. The rest is history. Bob Hawke became prime minister, and um, uh, differently to how it works. Um, these days, uh, Bill Hayden retained a um, very powerful role within the government. He was always up near the top. I think it was foreign and possibly trade. Um, so he's he's not someone who's he, I guess he'd come back and call him one of the power brokers of the party. Um, big man on campus, sort of thing. Um, and as Lindsay said, yes, always a staunch and declared atheist. Um, uh, so he's 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 come out and said there's been a gnawing pain in my heart and soul about what is the meaning of life, what's my role in it. So, as I said, 85 years old, he's had, um, you know, all, there's always going to be exposure, even if, whether you're an atheist, whether you're a Christian, Muslim, it doesn't matter what, there's always uh, an exposure to Christian faith in Australia. Now, he had a, his mother was a Catholic, he grew up, um, and you probably, probably a lot of people would have in those days, grown up with an education of it. But he attributes most of his, um, I suppose, the defining moment is a visit to, um, what's her name, a Sister of Mercy, Angela Mary Doyle, mm-hmm. who's been a pivotal person in his life, eight years his senior. Um, and he's essentially, for 22 years, been the administrator of Martyr Hospitals in Brisbane. And um, he went to visit her, uh, being a patient there, and the next morning he awoke with a strong sense that had been in the presence of a holy woman. And after dwelling on these things, I found my way back to the core of the, of the beliefs, the church. Um, now, a little bit of backstory. Uh, one of the things, as well as being an atheist that Bill Hayden is, I suppose, known for, is he was there at the dawn of Medicare. Now, something we, and possibly yourself, Caroline, mm. um, with Frankie recently yeah. after coming back from New Zealand. <laughs> um, we use Medicare a lot in yeah. my family in the last little uh, while. Medicare is basically univ- free universal health care um, for, yeah, for certain things. Um, including things like doctor visits, sickies, and um, sickies. <laughs> it's not for sickies. <laughs> it's um, not just for sort, sort of gen- general basic healthcare, universal system, um, eligible for all Australians. So I think prior to that, it was an opt-in private health only. Um, so he, as well as this uh, sister Angela Mary Doyle, helped champion that. And Medicare is kind of our safety net, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. it ensures that anyone uh, has uh, access to the most basic medical you know, help, you know, seeing a doctor or something if you end up presenting being ill. So it's a, you know, it's a service that we're grateful for. Uh, it's not something that, well, I, I would hope Australians don't take it for granted, but um, it's certainly something that's that's been there in some of the most, you know, most important parts of, especially if you've got young children, as we all know, and they get sick and something happens and they need, you know, care straight away or trying to get something diagnosed. Uh, it's it's always, um, you know, getting getting these doctor's visits through Medicare has always been a, a blessing in disguise on many, many occasions. Um, and this is the legacy of a hardened atheist, yeah, so, <laughs> a previously hardened atheist. Well, he, he's an atheist, but he when you look at some of the works that he's done and that he's championed, his, uh, n- you know, dissatisfaction is, um, is a Christ-centered dissatisfaction. He's not a bad man. Um, and, exactly. Yeah, and I think one of the comments or commentators have said on the accumulation of becoming a Catholic that it is, um, from you know a good man who has yeah, you know, it's it's come from a person who's done good works all his life. Um, yeah, Medicare wasn't a, you know, wasn't something that was 
uh, expected or wanted because or welcomes. Was, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think him and Sister Mary Angela Doyle had to fight quite hard to be able to get these things pushed through because they wanted to be able to provide basic, basic health services for the people who couldn't afford them at the time. Um, so yeah, and and um, I'll go back to some of the other things he said. So. He said he's got his message, he's learnt that the message of Christianity is of a religion not of rules but of love. Uh, it's about love for your fellow humans, forgiveness, compassion and helpful support. These characteristics are, found, are founded on the teachings of Christ and driven by faith in an external power, the Christian God whose limitations are beyond what humans could attain. And I love this line here, I can no longer accept that human existence is self-sufficient and isolated. It's like he's just recited another version of the Nicene Creed, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? And him wants a personal creed. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> also point out, um, and you were talking about how uh, he, it was important to him to find ways to help people through his political career. So here we are, a politician who actually cares about people. In, a, in the good in old a, days. Yeah in, a, in a, yeah, in the good old days. No, in a, in a substantial way without, you know, without the political wrangling and the, you know, the embarrassing the other side into doing good and things like that. Um, but Sister Mary Angela, um, cause I, I, I've, I've got this line in front of me in an article from the ABC, which is a, you know, which is a, a secular news source. It's our national broadcaster. Uh, and this is actually where I saw, uh, the story for the first time it was just on, on ABC news. And this line that she said is the line that, um, I've got here in front of me. I thought was quite amazing, but, um, she said that his baptism, which was in September last year was a natural outcome of the goodness that he had lived through his life or in through in his life. Um, and it, it says to me, uh, I mean, because we talk about grace and it's like, there's the operation of grace again. Uh, we, you know, we talk about people who, um, uh, you know, who are not Catholic, who can cooperate with grace because we're all by virtue of our, you know, of being humans, of being made in God's image, we're all open to the operation of, of God's grace in our lives and we can cooperate with it, uh, in, you know, because our, if anything, if, if there's no, um, if there's no sense of God or religion or anything, um, there is a sense in our conscience of what is innately right and wrong. And when we listen to the voice of what's right and we act upon it, we're actually, you know, we're actually cooperating with, with God who is, you know, in the world with us naturally. And so his cooperation, um, with grace, you know, the goodness, the things, the good things that came out of him, it, it's no, uh, cause my question was, well, how did this hardened atheist, you know, did, what, did he argue with someone? You know, did he sit down with a, a philosopher or a theologian and, you know, they, you know, the, the classic, they sat down for hours and hours, you know, all night arguing back and forth about whether a God exists. It was nothing like that at all. But her, her description is beautiful. He simply, uh, it was just the simple flowering or the opening up of the goodness inside him that led him to this choice. And he obviously, as you mentioned before, could identify in Jesus something that was always there in, in him, in, in what he was trying to do. So um, I, I thought that was really, really interesting. What else have you got for us? Very good. Um, yeah, the, the rest of the article more talks about um, you know, where he where he was, where he come came from. Um, yeah, plenty of people uh, are happy for him. I haven't been able to find the line I was after, but he did have somewhere that he again coming back to what you were saying about um, you know wanting to to be a politician, be able to help people. He was hoping um, that his baptism might in some way encourage people to look past the recent hardships of the church. Um, I'm probably I'm probably zoomed straight. Oh, here it is. Uh, he said he hoped his baptism might help others to see the importance of the church with fresh eyes, especially after revelations of clerical child sex abuse. The problems are caused by human agents of the church, but we shouldn't let our faith be undermined by the actions of agents who aren't quite as good as they should be. So again, that probably comes back to things we've talked about in our previous episodes of um, you know of uh, and especially the plenary council as well. Um, is you know the renewal, the focus on Jesus, not on the people, um, you know the people that exist in the church, but of the church itself. Yeah, that is really interesting. And Caroline, what do you think? You've got this this guy who, again, he's eighty five years old, and suddenly he, well, I guess it's sudden to us. We don't know what journey he's been through through the course of his life. This could have just been a slow awakening and opening for us. It's you know atheist. Not atheist, <laughs> athlete. But um, what what about this story resonates with you? Yeah, I mean, I have that same reaction. Like, um, yeah, wow, he was an atheist all his life, and now he's baptized Catholic. I mean, to from being an atheist to suddenly being baptized Catholic is is a huge big deal. You know, he, he uh, like some other people may take the journey through other 
Christian denominations, but he no, no, he went straight for Catholicism, straight there, the big one, you know. Um, and I, some people may find it hard to go straight to Catholicism, but he he did it, and he did it wholeheartedly. And I read somewhere in one of the articles that, you know, he was actually living a Christian life without knowing it. You know, just being a Christian man without even knowing it. all he needed to do was just take that step and um, be baptized. And I just think it's so beautiful that, you know, he he um in a way in a way gave in sort of and just said, okay, well, you know what, I I just should become a Christian and accept Jesus. And it was so, so lovely. And I mean, also I take from that that I'm actually really grateful to him because I didn't know all this history about how Medicare came about personally, but Medicare is a great help to the majority of Australians. Not everyone can afford to go and get, you know, health insurance to pay for their medical needs. But like having a family, you know, I've had to use Medicare for my personal health issues. I've had two babies through the public health system. Frankie's had two broken legs. He currently has a um, an ear infection that's made him partially deaf just for a little while. Hopefully that clears up. Um, you know, so for me, it's so refreshing to see that a politician was so dedicated to um, do something genuinely good from his heart for the people along with Sister Mary, Mary Angela. Yeah, yeah, Mary Angela. And you know what? I have a feeling because this doesn't just happen overnight. His conversion came through someone praying for him, you know. Um, these things happen. We've heard of atheists just it's like all of a sudden just changing and accepting God and saying, actually, hold on a minute, there is a God, you know, something happening in their life to um to their eyes are open somehow and yeah i just have a a sneaking suspicion somebody's been praying for him for a very long time so especially since he's had the association with other catholics you know during his life so yeah no it's a really happy story yeah and I, it's um it's also interesting i think um that uh cuz i was you know clearly uh, I followed up the story once I saw it in the news. Like, oh, quick, get onto Facebook and find the the ABC, you know, Facebook page and find it. Um, it's interesting, I find, and I'm not criticizing anyone, but um, the comments, you know, Facebook comments being what Facebook comments are. Um, I wasn't surprised that um, the comments were probably at least three quarters negative. Comments like uh, another one, you know, believing in a sky fairy or. Hope he enjoys praying to his spaghetti monster. You know all that. You know. I people, find you know yeah. what I find yeah. those comments like some people can be so. Especially I know like, there's a lot of atheists here in Australia, and I just find they come out on Facebook. They yeah. really do. And, and this is what I what I what I'm trying to get at. I, I think is I've learned over time that I don't think Facebook represents actual people's opinions because it tends to be like the most negative. They're the ones who go and make comments, and everyone else is a bit afraid because you don't want to get into that. Like I, I've been in. You know, I've commented on news stories in the past, you know, and, you know, nothing, nothing inflammatory, but just, you know, just thoughts about whatever. And people, inevitably, someone will, will troll you with, you know, a negative comment because, I don't know, it seems to be what they do. It's like, this is their playground and not ours in a way. But I guess the point I'm trying to get at is that, um, is that the Bill Hayden article stood firm telling the same story regardless of what people said about it. And I thought that's a powerful witness about how we, you know, how, um, we can consider ourselves as well. And I don't actually think the Australian community are really anti-religious. I mean, you know, there, there is anti-religious sentiment out there and it's small but it's loud rather than it being like 90% Australia, Australian population or whatever else. Um, and I think that it's the article shows me that um, people with religious conviction can stand out in society and regardless of the opinions of others because that's one of the things that i guess that we can be afraid of naturally we can fear what people say about us um but to me it um this article says well there's no us and them there's there's all of us um and you can decide how you want to respond to that and some people have decided to respond to that by saying you know oh look he's hedging his bets just in case he's an old man now we, you know uh, of course, people would get baptized when they're about to die, uh, which is kind of, I can't believe people, someone said that. Well, that, <laughs> not no, dead. not you everyone know, decides yeah. to get baptized <laughs> yeah. before. Yeah, but you know, there, there was that, those kinds of comments are the things that people were making. And, but to me, the story is um, he 
made a decision based on, you know, on the, the journey that he's had and he's discovered in himself. And it's a, it's a very honest journey. And yes, people who see it for the first time are going to be shocked and they're going to, they're going to say, yeah, it, probably, it was probably this, it was probably that. You know, just an old man making sure, you know, he covers all his bases and things like that. I think the witness is, of it is quite beautiful. And in fact, after this story happened, just before Christmas, he received his first Holy Communion as well. So I'm assuming he'll probably get his confirmation at some, t- some point this year. And I was going to say Holy Orders, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, know, but, um, you never know. Yeah, but his, his journey is interesting. And I'm, I'm grateful, I guess, that he's allowed it to be public because it's given him a chance to articulate why. And I think his why is very beautiful. And again, like I said before, it's not why because he, he demanded a bunch of arguments. You know, what are Aquinas' five ways that God is really, you know, none of that, all right? What, what, what it was is that he found that uh, what he was doing and what Jesus were all about was all about were very, very similar things. And it made natural sense to, to and it's not just believing, it's not just following uh, Jesus because he was a good person. It's because he has a belief that Jesus is this person who died for us. So. I think it's quite fascinating. Um, uh, Jerry, is there anything else you wanted to add to this before I move us on to the next topic? Um, that pretty well, <clears throat> pretty well sums us up. I think. I mean, it's you know, we covered his life and his and the nature of his conversion. I mean, it's um, some might say they sort of could see it, you know, could sort of see it coming. I think there was a comment from you know the aforementioned Gough Whitlam. Uh, I think at one stage uh, he'd said to Bill Hayden that you know, the Catholic Church is going to get you in the end. I think it was just sort of a joke. <laughs> but yep. it's funny how that sort of turned out to be prophetic. But sometimes when you've got someone whose work is a dedication to helping people, you can't help but potentially think you know, um, that they might you know, look into the reasons why, they, why they're doing such a thing. And, and you know, Bill being 85 and having 85 years worth of life to contemplate has, you know, has potentially now come to that you know, conclusion. Yeah, um, and he did mention um, you know, that that were it wasn't um, like you say a, a big argument conversation. Okay, you answer my questions, I'm done, I'm converted. That it was influence. He, he did very specifically say it was influence of people, um, positive you know, people who reflected and radiated positivity um, and and holiness. Not by, not by trying to, because that was the person they were, and that was someone something he admired. Yeah, um, I'll finish this segment off with this. At the end of the ABC article that I've, I was reading, um, he talks about the day of his baptism, and he said that his baptism ceremony meant a lot to him. When I went into the church that day, it was a hot day outside, and inside was very cool. It felt like a sanctuary, and I felt elevated in my chest. It was sort of ethereal, he said, and I thought, I've always been here. I should have. I should have shouldn't have wandered off. I do believe Jesus was a magnificent man. He suffered for our shortcomings. All of those lines, I reckon, should just end up on his tombstone one day. That were his memoirs or something. You know, those, they're just beautiful words to finish that. Okay, so let's move on to the world of science. Ah, what a fine day for science. Do you have any hobbies? I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Can you reverse the... Polarity. I'll do my best. Science, 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 science. Yeah, I like science. So, Caroline, we're in your hands. I think you've got two items for us today. So, why don't we start off with um, a, a great story that got a little bit sad. Yeah. And that was, uh, it was first. Well, it's still okay. Yeah. Tell us so, about the Chinese uh, okay. probe on, that landed on the, the yeah. so-called dark side of the moon. So towards the end of last year, 2018, um, China launched a mission to the dark side of the moon. I'm doing quotation marks. You can't see me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, can you see the dark side of the moon? Yes. <laughs> but go on. No. Um, so um, basically because... Um, we don't really know much about the side of the moon that we don't get to see on Earth. Now, it's not that we never, well, we don't see it because the rotation, the spinning of the moon matches the rotation of the Earth. So it just happens that we always see one face. If you want to read more about that, I'm sure Google has great answers, but that's basically why we only see one side. So, um, and it's not a very studied, the dark side of the moon is not a very studied side. So China have decided to launch a mission there and they landed there in early January. And um, 
The idea is to find out more about the composition of the moon and just um, also about um, how the Earth and the moon came to be the way they are. Um, apparently there should be some material from the Earth on the moon, you know, just so it's about finding out how Earth and the moon ended up the way they are um, currently. So that's one of their um, missions. But then they thought they'd throw in a little biology exper experiment as well. And in a collaboration of a few of the universities from China, they sent up a, a cylinder which contained potato plant and some, um, what do you call them, uh, silkworms. And there was another type of vegetation that they sent up there as well. And um, these plants, they were hoping, and the worms would create a little ecosystem and perhaps um, sustain themselves and be able to live and they'd have a little, you know, some, some life on the moon that we don't know about. No, that we know about because if there's life now, we don't know about it currently. Um, not, I mean, not big life like people. I mean like Microbes microbial and, life, yeah, yeah. <laughs> microscopic life. Um, so they sent up this cylinder, it's there. The plants did germinate, but unfortunately they were fine in the sun when the moon was, you know, exposed to the sun. But then when the moon spun around to their night time, the temperature plummeted to about minus 170 degrees Celsius. Off the top of my head, that was the figure. And so the opposite of an Aussie summer, basically, like what we're sweltering through. Extreme <laughs> opposite, okay, because we're having 40 degree days, 40 degree Celsius days at the moment. It's a bit unbearable. <laughs> it's over 100 hot. Fahrenheit. Yes, well that, that's right, yep. And uh, I think the plant kind of snap froze and um, didn't make it. So unfortunately there was life on the moon other than whatever we may not know about. Um, and now it's not there anymore and the silkworms I presumably it didn't make it either so um the temperatures basically are, are too extreme on the moon for any earth li life from earth to survive because the temperatures there's no like atmosphere like we have on earth um to keep in the warmth um and you know when it's night time it all just flies out into space so there's no warmth um so yeah so you know that's a exciting Thing, but we China were the first to put some life on the moon other than some humans, um, but unfortunately didn't make it. So, yeah, so all right, with potatoes, is that is there a reason for that? Were they inspired by a particular Matt Damon film or? Yeah, perhaps it, they it, were watching. Was it watching Mars? Hey, we yeah, can do that too. Yeah, and they thought, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I don't have a lot of information. It's not NASA are very good at providing every single drip of information that you want but um not so much with the chinese space um they show us the good stuff yes yeah. they show us the good stuff the cool but, you know, kudos to them that's great i mean yeah. they still get some fantastic information about the geology which i'm really looking forward to hearing about and um yeah as soon as they publish some of that i'd love to talk about it here as well so yeah. Yeah. And so what's the um the second story? It was about the they know what time oh, yeah. it is on was it was was it Saturn? Okay, gonna... so Saturn, we all know about Saturn. Well, if you don't know about Saturn, Saturn is a large gas planet. Doesn't have anything solid that we can measure at the moment. So scientists have had a really hard time finding out the length of a day on Saturn. You can't measure the spin. Okay, so finally They've managed to, um, through the Cassini mission, which is no longer, um, uh, we've been able to f actually work out the length of a day. Um, it has to do with the magnetic field of the planet. And now before, we, it was a little bit hard to measure, but now somebody intelligent over there in Spaceland <laughs> has managed... These, these are all technical terms, everyone. <laughs> has, I'm not giving the proper credit, I know that. Um, so um, they've managed to measure the magnetic field through the rings of Saturn. So they've managed to um, isolate some partic particles in the um, rings and through measuring that, they've managed to 
do a calculation, and it turns out it's about 10 and a half, okay, 10 hours, 33 minutes, and 38 seconds is the length of a day um, on um, Saturn. So wow. isn't that exciting? Can't that, get anything done. That's, you know, the cassette. No time I know. <laughs> it's, that's quite fast for a large, large planet. So, I mean, that's just one of the amazing things that the Cassini um, mission has um, provided for us. We're still, you know, analysing all that data. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the Cassini probe had to be crashed into Saturn last year because it was coming towards um, the end of its life. Could you tell what it was cra- what it crashed into, well, seeing as it was gassy? Well, the thing is, because the gravitational pull is so strong it would have just basically crushed and just the gravity disintegrated yeah, it, yeah. into something. So, I've seen Star Trek, I know how Yeah, yeah, okay. Obviously Star Trek. I've seen many Trek. shuttlecraft yes. colliding the atmosphere and crushed by something. Yeah, that's, oh, that's how it works. Please don't get me started. All right. Um <laughs> but that they they crashed it into Saturn to basically avoid um the probe possibly landing on one of the moons and contaminating it. I like us who are happy to contaminate our own moon. Within potatoes and, <laughs> potatoes and silkworms. And silkworms leaf flags and people. There. Yeah. But I guess since Within Superman there at one of Christopher Reeves. I Reed's know, moon, yeah, yeah. Yep. exactly. He flew past the moon in exactly. one of the movies. Yeah. Yeah. Wallace and Gromit there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wallace and Gromit, yeah, that's several, right. Several, several, yeah, yeah, versions of people have been up there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's just a little I remember that scene of snippet. Christopher Reeve as Superman putting the – because the flag gets knocked down. Oh, I think yeah. It was, it was like one of the worst Superman movies ever. Yeah. It was like the, the – Quest for Peace or something? Oh, was yeah. it number three Worse, or four? But you know what? Yeah. Still one of the best. Uh, as a child, I loved oh, it. Yeah, still love those the, early um, Superman films. The the mutant guy that Lex yeah. Luthor makes. I think yeah. he throws Superman That's and he right. knocks the flag That's over. That's right. Yeah, and then he comes and picks it's it up. All patriotic. And, yeah, he patriotic. comes and pushes it back yeah. up. Yes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Love it. Sorry, I'm distracting from your. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um. So thanks for that. We're gonna move on now. Oh, before you do. Yeah. Go on. Um. So based yes, on your Jerry. topics today, Caroline, of Saturn and the Moon, yes. what happens when you cross Saturn and the Moon? What happens when you cross Saturn and the Moon? What do you get when you cross what, Saturn and okay, the Moon? What do you get when you cross Saturn and the Moon? You get cheese rings. No, oh, oh my God. gosh. <laughs> Goodness me. <laughs> because Saturn has rings and the everyone moon knows moon. the Moon <laughs> is made of cheese. Sorry about so, that. Let, now well, we the can Chinese mission is going to confirm that or deny it for us. So, Just to yeah. all of our <laughs> listeners. Jared can't let that go because Jared is a massive Wallace and Gromit fan. I'm sure quite a few of you are. And anyone who's seen that episode knows what he's talking about. Oh. Yeah. And anyone who hasn't really, really should. You really yeah, should look watch it, it. It's actually, I'm sure you can get it on YouTube. Just I'm sure you could. What's it called? Do you remember the, what's it called? Um, no, I don't. Just type Wallace and Gromit, <laughs> the moon, you'll find it. Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you, you Jared. That. Yes, yes, thank you very much. I'll let you move on now. Thank you. I'm sure <laughs> someone is grateful for that joke. <laughs> so moving on. Um. We have a, another segment that we're gonna we're gonna bring up from time to time, um, and this one is called something personal. I bet you don't know anything about me. You were born in Phoenix. You went to school in Tempe. You're an only child. Your favorite show is something called The Real Housewives of Atlanta, and your favorite book is Kendall Jenner's Instagram feed. How did you know all that? So this is a um, a, a segment where. Um, we we talk about things that happen in our own lives, and uh, there's a reason why we've we've come up with this segment. Um, one reason is uh, because uh, you know sometimes uh, in podcasts people share things that happen to them, um, and it it's good for other people to listen because they you know they can relate. And I've heard, I've heard some great podcasts um, where the hosts have uh, sort of broken down the barriers of talking about apps and talking about productivity and talking about movies and whatever else. And they've just mentioned a life story, and it's been really good for everyone to listen to. Um, and the other reason, I think, is because uh, people who are listening can relate, um, and, and it's good for them to hear it, and they can share their own stories back and so on. And we like to do this, so we like to try and do this, is be- because we would like you as our audience. You know, we're a young podcast. This is episode three. Um, and we'd like to, you to know us as people, not, not just as you know, a bunch of Aussies who talk about all kinds of you know, things and, and make Jared jokes all the time. Um, so today um, I wanted to get the ball rolling um, because coming very soon uh, in February, in late February, is my second son's first birthday, if I got that right. So my, um, I've got um, a nine-year-old son, uh, sorry, a 10-year-old son, Damien, he's just, sorry, just turned 10 in January. Um, and we have our second son, Alexander, who's about to turn one. So there's a massive gap between those two boys. And I'd like to 
explain myself. I like to to talk about it and and, uh, and sort of discuss how this came about. So basically, um, uh, when Damien was born, um, uh, uh, just a little bit um, over a year, or well, under a year after Isabel and I got married, um, it was a wonderful occasion. We got you know really excited. You know, here's our first child. It's our son, Damien. All those kinds of things. Um, they made me an auntie. They made you an yeah, auntie. You're, you were the first one out of you know, first, all yeah. of our families yeah. as well. Yeah. I think he technically made you an uncle as well, didn't you? Yeah, because yeah, you've been married to my wife's sister. So, um, yeah, so Damien was, you know, was, was a big deal <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, <laughs> Top and, of the pile. Yeah. And I remember um, in marriage, in a marriage course that we did um, through the Archdiocese of Melbourne, um, they send you home because it was a two-day course. Um and what happens is after the first day, they send you home with a questionnaire that you and, and the couple... And a bottle of wine. Did and, you get oh, a, bottle a bottle of wine? wine. Got, yeah, we did get a bottle of wine. I remember getting yes, one. that's true, yeah. Um, which in some ways was more fun than the, the questionnaire, but because um, the questionnaire was, was, was kind of heavy content. And it was a questionnaire that the two of you talk about together, you know, set of questions. And one of them um, was the topic of children, you know, and it was like, you know, what's your ideal number of children that you'd be thinking of whatever else? And you know, we were joking like, you know, four, five, you know, <laughs> um, and, you know, and four, four actually came up because, you know, Caroline, you and I are, you know, are part of four siblings. Yes, we so are. am I, just yeah. not your four. Yeah, the, yeah you, Joe, you got Another a bunch four, of four, yeah. yeah. And so four was a number that we'd, you know, um, that we'd kind of talked about. Not, not that we'd say it must be four or, you know, four and no more. There you go. There's a t-shirt slogan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, you know, but we we just thought, uh, what's the you know, yeah, that that sounds pretty good. And, two and I'm through. I just had to yeah, put two, that. <laughs> um, all right. So while Jerry's thinking of his, we'll one, keep and going. one and I'm done. One and I'm done. There you go. <laughs> Which for fortunately for all of us has yeah. not happened. We're all. Um, yeah. So, uh, so after Damien was born, you know, shortly after, we're thinking, oh, you know, another one. You know, we'll, we'll probably have another one soon enough. Um. And a year went by, and two years went by, and three years went by, and there was no other baby. Um, and four years went by, and there was no other, you know, there was no second child. Um, so, you know, after the two or three year mark, you know, question marks start to pop around in our heads and, and doubts and so on. It's like, how, you know, why, you know, why was Damien so easy to to bring into this world and, and you know, and his brother or sister hasn't followed? What's, you know, what's going on? Um, and this was a this this was a journey that um, started bringing on a lot of questions, um, you know, silly questions like Isabel and I were saying, "Is it your fault? Is it my fault?" <laughs> you know, that was kind of the we were jokingly saying, you know, saying like things like that. Um, and it got to a point where you know, after about four four years or so, it started getting a little bit serious, thinking um, maybe you know something's not something's not right something's not you know something's not happening in the process that should result in a in a child you know coming about so um so we pondered it thinking it's you know something's not good um and i remember that there were many times where you know we were asking you know questions doubting ourselves a little bit you know feeling a bit like oh this is you know okay is damien's that's it we got damien and that's it and all the time we kept saying if Damien is all there is, then then Damien is all there is, and we're gonna, you know, give him the best life we possibly can, and do everything we can for him, and and love him, you know, without regret of the fact that he hasn't got a sibling. What made it harder for us sometimes is that Damien would come up to us and say, "When am I going to have a brother or sister?" That's a, that's a hard question from a child, especially um, you could see in his heart that he really wanted to know why, you know, um, other people around him had brothers and sisters, and and you know he didn't. Um, and you know, and I said, Damien, you know, if if um if a brother or sister comes along, if God gives you a brother or sister, we'll be the happiest people in the world, you know. But if, but if it doesn't happen, uh, where you know we are here for you. We've got you know you've got all your beautiful cousins and you've got so many friends, yeah, you know, and that's a wonderful thing, you know. And and he you know walk away with that answer, you know, you could tell he wasn't entirely happy, um, and he wasn't you know his happiness or sadness wasn't the reason why we started trying to investigate a little bit more, but it got to a point where you know, we discuss, you know, we, we want to have more children. We should, you know, we're going to try and find out what's going on here. So step one, uh, we went to our, we just went to our doctor and the doctor said, yeah, okay, you know, uh, it could be this, it could be that, the whole lot of reasons, asked some very general questions, didn't really 
have much to to offer us in return. He said, "Well, I'll um I'll send you to a specialist." You know, all right. So, all right. So we got a referral, went to a specialist, um, and you know the the specialist um when we when we saw him, we we left a bit unsatisfied with with what he had for us because um he said he he said things um you know that that we weren't entirely happy to hear like offering suggestions about what we could do about it um but none of his suggestions hinted at all about trying to find the cause so for example he said oh you know why don't you you can just try IVF yeah more about other ways of getting pregnant uh, rather than yeah identifying and yeah and identifying what might be stopping you doing it the natural way exactly and that that was kind of a no go for us because we again um I don't want to try anything uh, let alone things that we can't try anyway but you know I don't want to try anything uh, without the root cause, because what if there's a deeper reason? You know, th- there was, um, but you know, but that that sounds like uh, ignoring the problem and just trying, you know, trying another way, and that, that wasn't really um, what we were comfortable with. So, um, you know, he got our two hundred and fifty dollars, and we left with no answers. Basically, um, specialists aren't cheap. We were just talking about Medicare before. There's no Medicare for this. So, um, so again, kind of got into a bit of a slump what's going on you know what's happening i i remember um sometimes and uh you know isabel didn't find out this about this till later that um when she was asleep i would just put my hands in her tummy and say a little prayer <laughs> you know not like make one magically appear but like please help us find out what's going on you don't want you another know? miraculous conception yeah <laughs> yeah no that's already happened we don't want to you can't copy that there's no sequel <laughs> um and so um we um, were listening. Uh, I was listening, sorry, because I listen to podcasts all the time, you know, and Catholic Answers is one of the podcasts that, you know, that um, now there's so many that I haven't got time to listen to every one that comes out, but every so often I'll throw in a, you know, I'll see who the speaker is. And go, oh yeah, they're pretty interesting. And it was, uh, was it Dr. George Delgado? I think he's one of the, the fertility doctors they have on every now and then. And fertility, it sounds like just from when I listened to him, that like that was his thing. And he started talking about, um, uh, NAPRO technology, I think it was. And the whole idea was, uh, using medicine to investigate, uh, you know, uh, sorry, using like natural means to investigate what's going on first and then using medicine to intervene, you know, at each level, but not overdoing medicine, but, you know, just going in slow, s- small steps until, until you identify the problem and then find the way to solve the problem. So, um, then it, after a bit of Googling, with another friend of ours who was also Googling the same question, we found this lady who was about, I think, half an hour from where we lived, who happened to be a Catholic woman who was doing NAPRO technology like courses, like, you know, working with couples and doing some investigation. Um, and so through meeting her, um, we went, we did about five or six sessions with her. And it was a process of, you know, doing these charts. And it was especially intensive on, on Isabel because she had to do a lot of the work and I just had to say, yes, you can do it. <laughs> um, and she had to chart things and work out, you know, um, things about her fertility that were not, it's, it's kind of like getting in tune with your body and how your body works and things like that. Um, and then through charting, you start to find irregularities and whatever else. And Isabel had some really obvious irregularities that, um, that meant that uh, we got to the stage where this woman uh, couldn't help Isabel anymore but it was time to up what Isabel, the help that Isabel needed. So she knew a Catholic doctor, like a GP, who um, was also well-versed in NAPRO technology who could take the next step. So we went and visited this doctor. Um, it was kind of awkward at the beginning because, <laughs> you know, we sat down and said, oh, look, um, you know, we're, we're looking for a Catholic doctor who can help us investigate the cause. And she goes, oh, look, first of all, I'm Catholic, so it's okay. And then, you know, that broke the barriers down and we started talking. Um, and so she started, you know, investigating, looking at, you know, all the charts and things that Isabel had done over the last five, six weeks, whatever it was. No, or months, I should say. It doesn't work that way, sorry, <laughs> for months. Um, and the, the doctor said, look, it can be a whole lot of things. But she said, I'd like to do a couple of blood tests first. She said, sometimes in rare cases or in some cases, it can be celiac disease. And I was like, celiac, what, what? <laughs> um, and so anyway, Isabel and I like, you know, now heads, but it's not that, whatever. So we thought, all right, let her do the tests. You know, she might find something else. So she did the, did the tests, the blood tests and whatever. And we came back later on and she said, yeah, Isabel, you've got celiac disease. And, uh, and then I was like, oh, okay, so what's celiac disease? I'd not heard of it really. 
Um, and it's this, uh, it's this intolerance um, of wheat, like wheat molecules, all the things that wheat are. And when you eat uh, anything like bread, pasta that has, that has wheat in it, um, it, first of all, it, um, it mucks up uh, these little things in your intestines called villi, which actually absorb all the nutrients. So it actually starts to sort of diminish them, their function or kill them off or whatever else. Um, and so celiacs have been known to feel tired. Um, in more extreme cases, when they eat gluten, they get very sick. Now, fortunately, Isabel never got to that stage, um, but she certainly felt the tide. She felt like a heartburn, not heartburn, but like a burning kind of sensation when she eat the wrong foods and whatever. Um, and so through this, um, through this doctor's investigation, we worked out celiac disease, which can, which can mark up fertility. So great, we thought, all right, we know she's got celiac disease. So off we went on our merry way. Isabel had to go see a dietitian. Um, and the dietitian, after five or six sessions, you know, through that time, taught her about how to identify foods that are safe to eat and whatever else. You know, now we have, you know, we we most of the stuff we eat at home are gluten free, so we're all celiacs now. <laughs> but we all we all eat and and help Isabel with her diet through that. Um, but two years later, nothing happened. Like there was no baby. We thought, oh, you know, yeah, it, it got it got a bit sad, you know, trying to work out what was happening with us. And we thought, all right look, we'll just go with this celiac disease thing. We'll just do the right thing and help you with your diet. At least we found that out. I mean, you imagine if we didn't find out. So we thought, we'll go with that. Um, Damien's our child. We're a one-child family. Was it one and done? Was it? Yeah, okay. So that's the, so Jared was right. <laughs> Jared, you know, years later was right. <laughs> um, and we thought, all right, let that, that's where we are. Um, so, um, so we just continued living our lives and accepting that, that Damien was our child. And then last year in, uh, what I forgot what month it was, when Isabel uh, started telling me that things weren't feeling right with her. It'd be the year before, wouldn't it? Last, if you're last, talking about when you fell pregnant. Sorry, not last yeah, year. We just cr- he was just... born February last year and we're getting to his first birthday. So I'm talking about 2017, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't happen in a month. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry for sorry for fact checking you. That's no, all right. I our, wish it happened in just one month. Yeah, that no. would be much easier. Our, <laughs> in our species, it's nine months gestation. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, yeah, Isabel told me, oh, you know, things aren't feeling right. I said, I said, what's not feeling right? Um, you know, and because, uh, and you know, she started saying, you know, oh, I'm just feeling a bit sick, whatever else. She said, I thought before now that uh, things started to, were getting starting to get normal with me, but suddenly they're not normal again. Um, and then. She said, do, do you think I'm, I'm pregnant? And I said, look, I, I want to believe you're pregnant, but, you know, let's not get our hopes on whatever else. And so she, she decided to go and do a pregnancy test. Now, having given up on pregnancy, we had pregnancy tests that were expired. <laughs> so, so she went and did one. And she came back later and she said, oh, yeah, two lines. Two lines, is it? Does it? Yeah, two lines. Yes, two lines. Two lines. <laughs> so it means I'm pregnant. And I said, look. I want to believe this and you want to believe this, but let's not get our hopes up because I don't want to get happy and then find out, you know, and it gets torn away from us again or whatever else. So I said, go and do another one. <laughs> so she did three expired pregnancy tests and they all came up the same. And I said, let's buy some non-expired. <laughs> <laughs> let's buy some non-expired pregnancy tests. Both of us were in disbelief, right? So, so the next day, we bought some, and yes, there, there it was again, two lines. And I said, when she said, well, let's, let's go to the doctor. So the doctor then did a pregnancy test. Um, and, uh, you know, so I said, I said, does this mean? And she goes, well, look, she says, on, she said, on the box, it says 99.9% accuracy. Um, and so what she did was is she sent us for an ultrasound uh, because at, this, at that stage, Isabel would have been approximately six weeks pregnant. So off we went for an ultrasound. Um, and this, it was, it was like slow, excruciating torture, uh, because, you know, having, you know, eight years of, of no child and having become a bit jaded that we're ever going to have a child to break all those barriers down and, and to actually come and accept that we're having a baby again was really hard to do because we had accepted no baby. You know what I mean? It was, it was coming. So off we went ultrasound. And, uh, you know, the ultrasound specialist is, you know, moving that little paddle along and, you know, looking for things. And she goes, well, there's a fetal pole here. And, and apparently the fetal pole is like this, it's at the six week stage where it's like this little pole of tissue that's connected from one side to the other. 
this very little thing that's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, and, uh, and I said, so does that mean, and she goes, no, it doesn't mean anything yet. So she goes, hang on a second. So she zoomed right in and there was a heartbeat. There was a heart beating, like fluttering it as, you know, and there, and we're like, and she's like, yeah, you're pregnant. And like, yay, finally, you know, it still took a while for the disbelief to disappear, but, um, the, the change in, you know, from, from, you know, disbelief to, to joy was, was, was something amazing. Um, and she said, here's a little photo of your grain of rice. And she printed out this little, yeah. Um, and it was, and it, it really, it really, um, led us to reflect about a lot of things because obviously nine months later, Alexander was born and it was a beautiful moment. And I'll get to that in a second. But, um, there are a couple of things that, that we came to reflect on because we talk about how we have, we pray about things, you know, things that worry us and things that despair us and things that we're happy about and so on. And things that, you know, in our deepest desires, you know, talking to God about those. Um, and so what happened here? Because we prayed for eight years. How come uh, after, you know, how come after five minutes of prayer, God didn't answer our prayer, uh, you know, and a couple of months, or, sorry, or years after Damien was born, we didn't have, we weren't pregnant with Alexander. How come it was eight years after? And I think here's how it works. And, and the biblical figures, I think, are, are inspirations for this as well. And I think what you find is um, even biblical people, um, they had the same questions. They were relying on God, and it seemed like God wasn't there. But all the time, what their, what their faith was telling them, the ancient Jews, the, the, you know, the post-Jesus Christians, what their faith and what our faith is telling us now is that you've got to remember that God is always present regardless of what's happening in your life. So if we never had another child after Damien, it doesn't diminish God's presence. And what we had to remember was to be faithful all the time. Now, no level of faithfulness or faithlessness, I think, would have produced a baby for us. Um, that, you know, but what happened was, I think, is that we relied on God and we relied on trying to do things in the way that we understand through our faith. You know, for example, trying to get pregnant the natural way and all that. And we stuck to our guns on that. Um, and we were fortunate in that circumstance that we found a way through, and now we have an Alexander. I've got a little child who drools on my shoulder and and bites me all the time and chases me around the house crawling and you know and cries in the middle of the night and wakes us up. I'm not sure where the good parts. Are. <laughs> I'm kidding though. No. Um, so it got to the day. Well, actually, it got to three weeks before Alexander was born. Uh, sorry, uh, five weeks before he was born, and we were uh, we were with a, another with a baby doctor. They were watching Isabel's pregnancy. And we knew that, um, that Isabel had what's called placenta previa, which is where the placenta sits or the baby sits too low in the placenta. And that can cause a lot of issues with, you know, uh, with natural childbirth. And so the doctor said, yeah, look, um, this is a cesarean, basically. So if you don't do that, you're, it's, it's dangerous, very dangerous. You can both, both you, well, the mother can die from blood loss. The baby could be, you know, could be in a lot of trouble from a traumatic birth and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, and so, uh, on, so he goes, and this is going to have to happen three weeks before baby's due date. And so that was a bit of a shock because we'd prepared for a particular time, you know, not, not a, an actual date. We don't know when baby was going to come, but, but for a particular time. And now we're being told your baby will be born on this day, <laughs> at this time or whatever else. So, um, so that led to us having three weeks less to get ready. Considering you have nine months to get ready, we left to say a lot of things to the last minute, <laughs> um, and so we got to we got to the hospital at was it uh, six o'clock in the morning uh, on the day of Isabel cesarean. They said, "Yeah, there's you know there's three women who are having cesarean, so we'll let you know when you are." So we came in, uh, and you know they they said to Isabel, "You know if you have anything to eat this morning or drink," and she's like, "No, nothing, We're all good. She's good to go." They said, "All right, just wait here, and we'll let you know when your time is coming." And then um and so uh, there was another woman across from us who uh, who was also cesarean, whatever else. Uh, and we were just listening to the doctors talking outside of the of the waiting room, and I said, "Oh, uh, the woman who's uh, th this woman um, said that she had a cup of coffee." And I said, I leaned over to Isabel. I said, "Isabel, I think you're going to be first. <laughs> and and then I heard them say, uh, "I think we'll do the sand child first. <laughs> so, uh, so Alexander was probably meant to be born by by what they planned at some stage in the afternoon, but instead he was born at nine fourteen in the morning. Um, and when I went in, I won't. I won't describe uh, necessarily what I saw because I don't think everyone wants to hear that. Um, but I will describe one particular moment. So when they got uh, when they got Alexander out of Isabel, 
because uh, there's a big sheet covering all the action, the parts that you don't want to see. Um, and when Alexander was born, for a moment, it felt like the Lion King because the blanket came down a little bit and then they hold the baby up and it was like holding Simba above, above Pride Rock. And Isabel and I were both looking at him, like stunned. And then he started crying because he was really grumpy, I think. Uh, he was grumpy for the first 20 minutes of his life. And then he started crying and then we started crying. <laughs> it was, you know, and that did it all for us. And the doctor said, oh, so what's his name? And I'm like, well, it's, it's Alexander. You know, so all this stuff. And it was, but it was, um, it was really beautiful. Um, and, you know, he was just this scrawny little thing being three weeks early. Um, and we didn't sleep very well for the next six weeks or so. Um, but it was, it was the answer to all of our prayers, not because God snapped his fingers and, you know, and then suddenly a baby came about. But I guess it was the answer to our prayers in the sense that, okay, God, we'll follow you. You know, you, you know more than we do about the universe. We'll, we'll rely on you and then you fill out, you, you know, the, the, the rest of the details are yours. Um, and so he really was, you know, a beautiful gift from God. And we love our two boys a lot. Um, and I know that there'd be people listening who, um, ha- who have been in similar situations in terms of their, you know, the difficulties of falling pregnant or who are still in those difficulties. But I guess what I learned um, from this is that regardless of where our life takes us, let's just hang on to our reliance on God. God is there at the beginning of our lives. God will be there at the end you know, of, our, of our lives as well. And that, that is what gave me great comfort uh, is that God is faithful to us regardless of what we're going through and, and provides a lot of comfort in those times. Um, and I guess that's probably the lesson I learned. And it's, it's a lesson I, I haven't forgotten and I think will be with me for the rest of my life. So there it is. Sand baby. Yeah. But you know the most important thing about that story. What's that? Is apart from you and Isabel, I was the first one to hold him when he, <laughs> after he was born. Yeah, that's right. You got Because <laughs> your... I was so happy. Yes. And I remember when you were doing those pregnancy tests, like you were like, don't tell anyone, but I did a test and it came out positive, but it was expired. I'm like, you know what? I've done many tests. And if they're two lines, you're pregnant. <laughs> and it. I was like, that's I it, you you're that. pregnant. Yeah, yeah. And you were like, no, 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 I just, just want to, just, just wait, just <laughs> wait. But I was like, no, that's it, you're pregnant. I was so happy. So, like, we, we've we been on this journey with you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, me yeah, and Jerry you as part of us. your yeah. family. And, yeah, we couldn't be happier. We were there with you the whole time, you know. So, um, yeah, just we agree, you know, keep the faith and – um you're rewarded in the end and we're rewarded too because we have another boy, another nephew in our family. That's right. Yep. Um, Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll leave that segment there and, um, you know, we'd be happy to hear and share stories if you'd like us to, or, you know, stories from, from any of you who are listening about, um, about things like these as well. Uh, It helps us to build a community to all of us to get to know each other. So, you know, Jared and Caroline over time will, will have their stories too. We don't know how often we'll do this, but, as things come up and as we feel willing to share, we'll, we'll throw our, our hat in the ring and say a couple more things about ourselves. So um, this podcast is going to go a little bit over time, but we just wanted to talk about one more thing very quickly. Um, so we're going to change direction very quickly and talk about what's happening. The Enterprise computer system is controlled by three primary main processing cores, cross-linked with redundant Mellicourt's Ramistat 14 kiloquad interface modules. The core element is based on an FTL nanoprocessor with 25 bilateral telelaterals, 20 of those being slaved into the primary Heisentram terminal. Now, you do know what a bilateral telelateral is. Well, of course I do. So uh, this is a very poorly named segment about... Uh, you know, I think it's very punny. Yeah, it is very punny, yeah. Um, and it's about uh, some of the apps that we use, that, that um, some that entertain us and some that help us to be productive or or to, um, to help us do things in our lives. So um, we're going to do a, a quick whip around the table about some apps that, we're, um, that, that we can't get rid of because they're useful to us or because we're, we're hooked on them. So Caroline, what is the first app that, that you were hooked on? Okay, so the first app that I'm absolutely hooked on and I must play every day is part of my routine is the Angry Birds Blast app. <laughs> okay, so when ang- I think most people know about Angry Birds. When it first came out, I was hooked, you know, you'd like put a little bird on the, what do you call it, catapult, Catapult, yeah, yeah. and you'd throw it and it hit a pig and they'd pop and all the rest of it. So (laughs) satisfying. But 
this one's more like a puzzle game and I love puzzle games. You know how you get things like blocks in a row or, you know, spheres or squares in a row and you, you press them and it disappears and you get point. I just love games like that. So this one is a bit like that. And as well as getting things in a, like, yeah, well, they're balloons, it's called, um, balloons in a row, you pop them, it's so satisfying, and there's pigs next to them. So if you pop next to a pig, it pops the pigs, and it's just, I don't know what, actually, look, I'm going to check what level I'm on. <laughs> you know, I've been playing this literally for years, <laughs> a lot, since it came out. It, the app is just starting. Hang on, I need to tell you what level I'm on because I don't even know. Um, I can tell she's really excited by this. I love this game. <laughs> um, so I'm on level, come on app. Where is it? 492. Wow. Okay. Wow, wow. <laughs> that has been a lot of battles, a lot of puzzle games. <laughs> but I absolutely love this game. It's just so satisfying to pop those bubbles <laughs> and to do the puzzles. So, yeah, that's, yep. that's my first um, silly thing that okay. I'm addicted to. What's an app that, um, you, uh, that you love for productivity that so helps you to be more productive? productivity, this is more of a sensible, useful app. Um, <laughs> it's called InkPad. And it's a basically a drawing app that you use on the iPad. And for those people who um, use you know, Adobe Illustrator or um, similar drawing apps on the computer, this one is a version for the iPad. So you get the Apple Pencil. And what I use it for, I've actually self-published um, two children's books. And the one that I've done um, using InkPad is called Topsy the Cat. You can find on Amazon if you're interested. <laughs> but um, if you do buy it, make sure you go amazoncom smile, choose SQPN as your that's charity. That's right. Then actually, buy it. <laughs> do that because yes, it helps help SQPN, SQPN. Yep. exactly. And um, um, but it's a really good um, drawing app. You use the pencil instead of a mouse. Um, it's got all a lot of the functionality of um, Adobe Illustrator. It does the vector um, drawing and everything else, and you can save the images and they'll go into Adobe. Um, and I've just I've just really enjoyed using it for illustration. It's just really fun to use and really useful. So yeah, and I've just created my the pages of my book, entire pages, just using that text and drawing. So um, yeah. Great. Those are my two apps. Yeah, excellent. Your illustrations in your, you know, in your children's books are beautiful, and as oh, well as your you. other drawings. Yeah, and yeah. it's on, on the power of an iPad, which is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. no, I've really enjoyed using it. Um, yeah. yeah. Jared, what's your addictive app, first of all? I've got a couple, so I'll skim over them sort of quickly. Um, the first one is, uh, it's a similar to a Clash of Clans type game where you build yourself a base and go and pillage someone else's. <laughs> um, but this one is called Plunder Pirates. So you're basically um, on an island and you sail off to other people's islands and basically steal all of their alcohol and all of their gold. <laughs> um, I suppose it's strategic in a way in that you set up your base to be more resilient to attacks um, and at the same time try and find and expose weaknesses in someone else's. Um, you attack from the water, so there's always got to be water where you where you land. Um, so one of the you know, methods of attack is to try and find perhaps a patch of water within their base, which someone has you know, neglected to cover up. Um, it's what I suppose I, I like about it is the events that they have run uh, for about a week, um, and there's no real you know uh, no real competition in that. You don't have to be top of the pile, or you don't have to keep going and going just to be just to achieve more than each other. Um, your achievements are based on your on how much you do, um, which which I like as opposed to you know being the top ranked um, yeah. player or you know having to keep fine to improve your rank. Very cool. And what's um, your um, a, what's your um, other one? And then the other one I play a bit with my daughter is one called Flutter. That's just a butterfly game <laughs> where, you, where you basically you know, use flowers and attract butterflies. So they're my they're the ones that we sort of addicted to. We play, I'll play those you know both re, you know, pretty much every day. Nice. Um, in terms of productivity ones, um, don't use the screens a whole lot at this stage. But one I've um, or two that I've sort of found are, are Care Monkey, um, and School Bag, and they're both school apps. So. Uh, Caitlin, my firstborn daughter, just finished grade prep and they've just rolled these out during the year. Um, really have improved. Um, we used to get, you know, newsletters by paper and, and 
um, you know, uh, forms to be able to go on excursions, etc. You know, where they'd end up, bottom of the bag. Oh, look, this is this, this is my form to go on. You know, somewhere in March, and you find it at Christmas, <laughs> covered um, in squash banana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, all of it's all of it's done online. So, quick tap of the button, um, and you're away. Now, it's also got the paying for lunch orders is all online now. So, uh, I don't know how widespread it is across you know Victoria, even Australia. Um, but using going all online for keeping school apps has just made that a whole lot easier. A couple yeah. of keys to the button, you're away. Yeah, they're really good for school parenting kind of things, aren't they? Yeah. Um, all right, so I'll do my two really quickly. The first one is my addiction. It's called Clash Royale. Um, and Caroline, you were talking about being a long-time member. I got a, I got a two-year badge for playing it for two years. Yeah. And um, I've accumulated just over 4,000 trophies, which oh has put goodness. me in like, one of the higher leagues, which is really good. And I've kind of plateaued. That's a really hard league to get further up in. Um, but it's basically this, uh, this game where you've got, you play against other players and you make what's called your deck, which is your little soldiers. You choose combinations based on abilities to try and have a good attacking and defending force. And, um, basically you've got three castles, they've got three castles and you've got three minutes to try and destroy as much as you can. And whoever destroys the most basically beats the other person. And then you get a certain number of trophies based on, on your win and whatever else. Um, what I love about this game though, um, there's another reason why I like to play it is because when you reach a certain number of trophies, you can join a, what's called a clan. So users make all their different kinds of clans up. Um, and I found a Catholic clan called Catholics Rock. And what's really interesting about this is that um, it's just a bunch of Catholics. There's a couple of different ones. But it's a bunch of Catholic players who, um, you know, who basically support each other by, you know, trading cards and, you know, and contributing cards to each other's deck and whatever else. Um, and every now and then people ask for prayers, which is really cool. Or people say, you know, at major like Easter, Christmas or major solemnities, people go, hey, you know, happy this, you know, happy feast of that or whatever else, which is really nice or, or share scriptures and things like that. And actually, funny enough, on the morning that Alexander was born, I just remember this now, on the morning that Alexander was born, I had to wait for about 20 minutes away from Isabel while they prepared her for surgery. I wasn't allowed to be, be anywhere near there. So I whipped out my phone um, and I reached out to these guys. I said, hey, I said, hey um, my you know, my son, or sorry, no, my child, I didn't know what it was going to be. My child uh, or baby is going to be born, um, you know, soon. Um, uh, you know, I'd appreciate some prayers. And people wrote, you know, praying for you, praying for you, whatever else. And um, and I think it was just before Christmas uh, last year that I wrote, hey, I've, you know, I really enjoy being in this clan. I remember when you guys prayed for me and my family. And when the guys go, oh, I remember that, I remember that. And uh, the other thing I did was I said to them, um, I said, hey, so, you know, so we're starting this podcast called Catholics of Oz on SQPN, you know, do you guys mind if I mention, you know, like, you know, um, our clan where I was like, oh, they're great. And one of them goes, oh, SQPN, I really love Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. So, you know, a few people had, you know, um, had already been familiar with it, which was, re which was really cool. So shout out to Catholics Rock. <laughs> it, was a, it was good. My productivity app really quickly um, is called Office Lens and it's a Microsoft app. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Microsoft have really turned it around the last couple of years. Office Lens is another scanning app, um, but basically you can scan documents and, and things with it. What I find is really good is it's got a paper mode, it's got a whiteboard mode, and it's got this kind of custom mode. Um, and what happens is, um, depending on what you, cho you choose, uh, it will automatically adjust, and you don't have to be standing right in front of the object or at a perfect angle. You can take the, the picture at some really dodgy angles and it will kind of auto adjust it um, for you. And I found as a teacher, it's really useful. But also, um, if I want to scan my paper bills or you know scan other important documents and archive them um, electronically, it's really good for that. Because once you scan them, you can save them as PDFs. You can upload them directly to Dropbox or you know your other um, you know your other online storage media, um, or you can email them to someone straight away or text message them. So it's it's really good for that. So Microsoft Office Lens. I get paid nothing for promoting Microsoft in this podcast. Yeah, I think um, just quickly, it's one of the undersold elements of a game is when it turns into a community. Um, Definitely. Yeah, uh, playing Plunder Pirates, um, that actually was born out of another game, Tap Paradise Cove, which uh, ended uh, at the end of last year. Um, you know, it'd been around for six years and games were just getting more and more advanced and they just couldn't keep up. But I'd, I'd sort of wandered into a, I suppose, a guild or a clan there, and you know, I think probably 2017, I think. Um, they'd been going on since the since day dot, um, but they have, you know, they communicate. You know, it's big, big on communication, um, 
and when you were talking about um, you know praying for Alex, I remember that you know they've got a specific chat set, chat room set up for you know for prayer request. That's prayer amazing requests. Yeah, um, and I think I think um, it's probably more uh, socially acceptable to bond over TV movies and things like that. But I think you get a deeper bond when you bond with someone over a game because from what I could see, you know, I, as I said, I only rocked on the, the Paradise Cove game scene in 2017, whereas these ones have been doing it for six, seven years by that time. Um, the bonds there were really, really strong. And people would, you know, some some people would keep playing the game just so they could hang around, you know, their, I suppose, virtual friends or their, their online friends. And you can see the depth of the relationships that um, you know, a game can bring. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, well, so let's wrap it up there, I guess. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for episode three of Catholics, uh, Catholics of Oz. Oh, sorry, Catholic Oz of Catholics of Oz. Um, have you got a story to share with us? So we, you know, I told you a bit about myself. Do you want to share some things about yourself so we can get to know who you, our uh, SQPN audience is, the a part of the greater SQPN community? Um, you can send us feedback by visiting sqpn.com slash oz or you can go straight to the SQPN Facebook page and leave comments there. You can also email us at oz at sqpn.com. All the relevant links from today's discussion will be in our show notes at sqpn.com as well. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and anywhere else where good podcasts are found, including ours. Um, And remember to leave us a review to give us five stars, anything that helps us to share um, with our community. Caroline, thanks so much for being on the podcast Thank today. Thank you very much. And Jared, thanks so much for everything. Yep, very glad to have done this today. And once again, I'm Lindsay Sant, and thank you for listening to The Catholics of Oz.